Carmen, what's going on? How's it been? I haven't talked to you in a while. I know. I've been working. I just got off work. So today, I hit another milestone. I kept getting frustrated, and I was weighing myself every day and getting upset. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to focus on that. So I didn't really do any weigh-ins. But today, for some reason, I did, and I thought, you know what, let's just try, see what it says, see if I had any progress. So this is, what, seven months, I hit 40 pounds of loss, so that was another plus for today, so it was good, it's good. I had to buckle down and get serious again, because last week with the holiday and all the stuff I had to do for the festival lost track but I hit it hard coming back and had two workouts in a day I did some cardio in the evenings after my workouts in the morning and get back on track on my macros and eating right so it works (laughs) yeah awesome so 40 pounds down in seven in seven months yes okay so when was the last time that you took a weight prior to what yesterday Oh, it was, it was a while ago. I was over probably a month or so. Oh, okay. Like I said, I was getting frustrated because after the, that hundred days and I lost 30 pounds and I was like, here it comes. And there, then it just like plateaus. As you told me, it's harder to lose a little bit of weight after you lost a lot of weight and then the timing and stuff. And like I said, I'm building, so that counts for it too. But I was always focused on that number. And that number wasn't changing, but I was still making progress and not knowing it. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things to look at here. Number one, let's kind of look at like the big picture. So seven months and 40 pounds. So that's an average of five, just over five and a half pounds, almost six pounds a month. And if you break that down per week, that's still over a pound a week. And as far as sustainable weight loss, like real actual fat loss, not just like water weight, bullshit weight, like stuff that's going to come right back. Like that is exactly what you want. So the pace that you're on, like big picture, right? That's the thing to remember. Like it's easy to get frustrated in the short term, but you got to, you got to step back and look at it from a 30,000 foot view, right? So in seven months, you are exactly on pace for exactly what you need to be doing to create long-term health and long-term weight loss. That's perfect. So in so inside of this big picture, you're going to have all these little mini struggles and mini battles, right? So if you look at it from like, I see tons of stuff in through the lens of like comic books and, and story arcs, right? So if you think about the, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? So they have this overarching theme of like when it started, right? So you have all the Avengers that are coming out and they got these little pins and these little mini adventures that they're having, but there's this overarching battle that's like always in the background or in the foreground, depending on where they're at. So you got to look at it and say like, all right, there's this big picture. And then inside this big picture, there's all these little mini struggles and mini battles that you have to fight. And that's the daily stuff. But the daily stuff, while it's important, isn't as important as the big picture. So even if you get your ass kicked in a day, it doesn't mean that you lost. Yeah. So it's, you just have to view, make sure you're monitoring your frame. Like you, you don't get so stuck here that you don't, you're not able to back out and see the whole thing. Cause that's when people quit when they're not able to do that's when people quit, but it does get frustrating. But if it didn't get frustrating, then you wouldn't have days like this where it was super awesome. So you have to be able to balance that and you have to be able to roll with the peaks and the valleys. Yeah. And there's sometimes where you want to throw the towel in and just give up. But I thought, look at how much progress I've made. Do I want to throw all of that away or do I want to just refocus and reset? Obviously I'm still doing it. So I've, I don't notice it myself. And when I hear people say, gosh, I don't even recognize you anymore. And I'm like, I don't notice a difference, but other people are noticing it. That's, I guess that's a, another positive to see it from a different perspective because you always look at yourself differently than other people do. And then that's where it's important too. And that's a good transition to my next point is like having other metrics to look at, right? So remember body weight is one metric. Like it's an important metric. And I think going a month without getting a weight is probably not a great idea. You know what I mean? But I understand why you did that, right? 
So moving forward, have different metrics to go off of. So it could be like waist measurement, arm measurements, like taking a tape measure out and doing that. Because that, like you're talking about, like building muscle, changing your body composition might not result in a weight loss, but it doesn't mean that you're not resulting in fat loss. Another thing to look at is as you get more body fat off, you might want to look at a DEXA scan or something like that. Do that quarterly or once or twice a year, even you go lay down, they do the full scan. They tell you exactly how much body weight you have or how much body fat you have, how much lean mass, how much it gives you the full rundown. It's really pretty cool. I do know for this shocked me the last time I did a measurement, my waist is the same as my 16 year old son's and from start till now, I've lost 16 inches just on my waist. And that blew my mind. Cause like my son is an athlete and he's fit. And I'm like, wait a minute, you have a 32 inch waist? <laughs> what? It blew my mind. I was like, this, there's no way. There's no way. And then it did. It was that, that was, like I said, unbelievable to me. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, like you have to have several metrics, right? So measurement, body fat percentage, DEXA scan, body weight daily, pictures, pictures are huge. Pictures are so easy and nobody likes to do them. But honestly, like I started doing it when I did, I did a, a, like a 75 hard, like two years ago or a year ago, something like that. And I was like, I don't know if I told you this or not, but they have you do pictures every day. And I thought this is stupid. This is excessive. Why I feel stupid doing this. But I tell you, I did that every day for 75 days. And it was actually really powerful to go back and look at the progression and just go back and look at your day one, day 75. And there's something about that accountability of I'm taking pictures every day, right? And some days you're not going to be happy with it. Some days you're going to be like, I don't see a change. And some days you're going to be super stoked about it, but you just do it every day. And then to be able to see that, that progression, like you said, you don't notice it when you're living in your own body. You're like, it's so minute and it's so, you just don't notice it. So those pictures every day are going to show you the things that you don't see. And that's something you can keep just for yourself. You can put it in a little file on your phone or whatever, and just keep it hidden, keep it tucked away. And that's just for your own reference, but that can be a really powerful thing to do. And then when you do have whatever celebration, you can post them and get a bunch of attention and be like, look how cool I did, that kind of stuff. But yeah, so multiple metrics, right? That's the key to that story, multiple metrics. Okay. What else you got? Anything? No, like I said, still positive. So going still pushing a lot of people, like I said, other people notice and other people have questions. And of course, I try to send them your way, but it's, it's, you had touched this before on a different call mindset, getting back into that right mindset, because that to me, that's the majority of this going forward, having the right mindset and not feeling defeated. That's huge. And I'm bet better doing better on that. That's good. And I, I think that Keeping that idea and that concept of there's the daily, the tactical struggles, the mini battles, and then there's the strategic, the big picture, right? And Jocko talks about this a lot, like tactics versus strategy. Tactics are short-term, tactics are day-to-day, minute-to-minute, but the strategy, the strategic view is big picture. And that can be as far out as you really want it to be, like as far out as your brain can manage it. Like you can have a strategic view of six months, 12 months, five years like whatever you want it to be, like however long this thing is for you, that's what your strategy needs to be. And that's where it's like, we can't get too caught up in like, I I know this program's the heroic 28, 28 days, but at the same time, like we can't get too caught up in just a matter of days. So this is a long-term thing. Yeah. And then I have my goal. So I'll be 50 in October and that's what I want to realistically lose 50 by time I turn 50. So So I've got three months to lose another 10 pounds. Pretty close. So just stay on track. Just stay on track. Yep. And if you ramp it up and you can feasibly go pound and a half, two pounds a week, and that's just, you know what that's going to take. That's going to take like, like taking the 80% to 90% and, and just dialing it up to make it faster and being more aggressive with it. Now you're going to hit a ceiling when it's like, you you probably can't do too much more and you're just going to have to like stay on track, keep doing it consistently. And then that's when it's like, all right, are we doing everything? And that's when like we've talked about, it gets harder to get that pound 
It's before I worked this hard and I got 12 pounds off in, in two weeks. Why is it not working now? And it's like, right. as, as we climb the ladder, like it gets harder and harder. It doesn't get easier. The lower, the lowest hanging fruit is easiest to pick for a reason. Like the stuff at the top of the tree, you got to work for. So that's, you got to keep that in mind too. Yeah. But you got plenty of time for it. <laughs> and as long as you, as long as your strategy is good and your tactics are good, like I, I don't see a reason that that you won't hit it. Protein, total calories, and make sure that we're working in a deficit that's manageable and sustainable. And then, yeah, and keep crushing it. Okay. Thanks. Justin, what's up, dude? How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. So what's going on? How are things going? Pretty good, actually. I don't really have much to say, I guess. I just, I really like the heroic app with the workouts and everything. That's probably one of the biggest reasons why I, I reached out to you because I just have always struggled making workouts. I feel like I have a base knowledge of how to put a workout together, but I feel like when I do stuff, I never, not exhausted, but I don't, never feel like it's strenuous enough. And I feel like with what I've been doing with, with these, I feel worked out at the end of the, at the time, which is good. Good. Awesome. Yeah. It's always easier to like just follow a plan than it is to try to come up with it. And then, cause then you have to use creativity and use parts of your brain to come up with the workouts creatively. And then you have to execute on the workout itself. So it's like from just a mental draining standpoint, it's like a double whammy. So it's always better in my opinion to just have a workout that you're following. And that, that goes for me too. There's a lot of times that, that I'll just, I follow a couple different programs usually. And I'll just be like, nope, I think I'm going to just follow a program today because I don't have the mental capacity to do anything else. So there's that aspect of it. For sure. Yeah, it's definitely made it nice. We just had our fourth kid in January. So it's, and I've got a gym in my garage, which makes it easier, but it's still hard to, in the past just to get out here, but then let alone have to think of what am I going to do and make it hard. Yeah, we get real good at following directions. So just follow directions. It's easy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right. So how's uh, nutritionally, how are things coming along? P pretty good. I think the hardest thing is getting the protein in. I've had to get creative trying to get, I don't think I've really gotten close to the 257 grams a day, but I've, uh, I've probably gotten close to 200 every day. Okay. What's your current body weight at? I started this at 216 and I just weighed myself today. I'm 211. And I, a lot of that could be fluctuations in water weight because I did go from not drinking a ton of water to I've been drinking about one, probably just under a gallon to a gallon a day. Okay, cool. That's perfect. And so as far as protein goes, like you don't, so a, about a pound to one gram of protein per pound of body weight is for you is going to be fine. You can also okay. one pound or one gram per pound of lean body mass. So if you knew like lean body mass was as, total, as, your, as opposed to your total weight, then you can go off that. So really anywhere is good for you. I'd say probably between 175 and 205 as far as okay. grain protein a day. You're probably totally fine there. So if you're hitting yeah. that, if you're hitting that, just keep rocking at that. And then, and then I would say from, a, do, what are your total calories been? Do you know? Well, I did the, going off the math in, in that video for me, it was like supposed to hit 2,500 a day, but honestly, I haven't really come. I've probably been between 19 to 2,300, I'd say. Okay. So if that's the case and you're still kind of low, make sure primary number one, make sure you're hitting that 200 ish grams of protein, give or take five grams. That's priority one. And then priority two is just trying to get close to, I would say, 2,100, 2,200 total calories. Don't kill mm -hmm. yourself trying to get 2,500 in a decent deficit. And I think if that, you'll be shocked that eat, if that's a large departure from the amount of protein that you've been taking in, like it, it's, it's definitely more. Yeah. So if this is definitely more protein than what you have been eating and we can get your calories in the ballpark of we're still in a deficit, it might be a little bit bigger deficit than I'd like to see. But I think you're going to be fine and, and yeah. you'll have good results. And then if your hunger levels go up, then we can actually increase your calories a little bit before we start cutting them back down. So we get you yep. up to that, like a, a, a lower deficit. Like we don't, where people usually screw things up is they want to get into deficits that are way too big and they're way too aggressive. And just like what I was talking to Carmen about, they're just totally unsustainable where it's mm -hmm. like, you'll have maybe really good results for a week or two. You'll be like, oh, I did all this stuff, but then you're so fucking hungry and so tired 
and so just devastated from the immense stress of being in a huge calorie deficit. Plus you got a new kid, plus you got four kids, plus you got a job where you're working nights. Like it's totally unrealistic. So yeah, I would say 2,100, 2,200 total calories, 200 ish grams of protein, give or take five either way. Mm -hmm. And, and keep rocking it out for a week or two at that. And as long as the scale is still going down, like perfect, mm -hmm. it's not going down after seven to 10 days, then we jump on another call and we reassess things and see where you're at from a number standpoint and then how we need to balance that out to, to get the scale to move. For sure. I've already noticed that, like a change in body composition, just getting back into working out. And I've noticed my strength go up, which I'm really like, liking to see, obviously. Probably the best I've felt physically in, in quite a while. Good. That's all good. Like those are all like, like what I was saying, like multiple markers, right? There's another marker that, that I didn't mention with Carmen was just how you feel. And if you're noticing like, man, I just, I'm sleeping better. I feel better. I'm in a better mood. That's what I've seen a lot, especially with like female athletes over the years is like when we start working on nutrition and actually giving them more food and more protein. So I just don't feel as mean anymore. So oh, look at that. That means your hormones are improving. Like things are going in the right direction. I had one athlete at the, when I am the gym and I was like, I just don't feel like I'm a bitch as much. I was like, that's a bonus. That's great. <laughs> we love that. I'm sure I'm not the only one that thought that. Yeah. But, but yeah, another thing that we don't like, we don't talk a ton about, except for sometimes on, on one-on-one -on -one calls is like sex drive, hormones, stuff like that. That's all important to, to make sure you're monitoring too, especially on nights. Like if you work nights, like stuff like that can creep up on you. And that's why it's so hard on your hormones. Like all of these factors, like you have to monitor those. Anything else? What else you got? I don't know. I think I have anything else. I think I'm feeling pretty good right now. Participants. All right, cool. Hang on one second. Let me, right. if you guys don't have any other questions, you can feel free to jump off and, or if you want to stick around, you can feel free to do that as well. Go ahead and jump off and get ready for work. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, dude. Yeah, I'm just going to go and record some stuff. Carmen, you can feel free to stick around. I'm not sure. There's some guy just, one of the guys just texted me, said he's going to jump on too. So there might be some more people on here. There might not be, but I've got some stuff to just record on some other stuff too. Like I said, you can stick around. You can not like all good either way. All right. Just going to go over some notes that I had before the call tonight. Honestly, Carmen, we went over most of this earlier, but like some basic stuff that I think everybody should kind of know. And you can use this too for anyone that's asking questions and you're like, I don't know, this will help to kind of provide them with some direction if they don't want to just reach out to me or if you don't have the answers for them or whatever. So nutritionally, like how to weigh and measure food. So that's really important to know how to do that. It seems very basic, but you need a food scale and it's got to be one of those little digital ones. You can buy them at any, anywhere, Myers, Walgreens, Walmart, they all have them like little dope dealer scales, right? But uh, you have to put your plate on, zero it out, and then weigh the food individually. So if you're cooking like beef, rice, and broccoli, then you need to weigh each of those separate components out individually, and then enter that food into MyFitnessPal or whatever app that you are using. You could also write it down, but you're going to have to Google and figure out what the exact carbs, fats, and proteins are and total calories for. If it's eight ounces of beef, five ounces of rice and 10 ounces of broccoli, you're going to have to know what those are. You're going to have to figure that out. So you're either going to have to look it up and write it down and add it all up, or you can just put it into an app and use technology to make your life easier. My fitness pal is the one that I use. I've used several of them and I always go back to that. It's just got so much of a library of food that it's, it's just really convenient and simple to use. So that's got to go in there and then that will auto populate all of your carbs, fats, proteins, and all of your micronutrients too. So a bunch of, a bunch of micronutrients populate in there as well as like sodium and uh, fiber and stuff like that. So you get a lot of information from that. Okay. Once you get that all entered in, then you eat said food, you consume the macros and then, and then pro tip. And that's really it. So like bonus pro tip here, this is number four, enter your food in early. So tonight, before you go to bed, you should know what you're eating tomorrow. And like I mentioned, if you want to take this, you know, this deadline of October, right? If you want to really ramp this up, this is how to do it. Okay. So you enter the food in the night before. 
You have it all set up the night before. You know exactly what you're doing the night before. So tonight, when everything is entered into my fitness pal, all your meals for tomorrow. And then all you have to do is stay on that plan. So that way that you are on a plan, you're on track, and all you have to do is execute the plan. And it makes such a huge difference. It doesn't seem like it would, but it does. And anytime I need to ramp things up or I want to tighten it up a little bit, this is what I do. And it makes such a difference to have that plan in place versus trying to like chase your tail almost like trying to fit these macros into the day or trying to do it after you eat them. And it's never as effective when you do that. If you factor those things in before and then you just consume it, there is a way more likelihood that you're going to be compliant to your own plan. Okay. So that's the pro tip right there. That's, that is like the secret sauce for the day. All right. Protein, protein, continue to get protein. If you have a day or a week that kind of gets away from you where it's like, man, this did not go how I thought. Like for me, I've got, I've got a ton of night details this week, like probably four of them training and work. So I'm running on three and a half hours of sleep from last night. I'll probably get about five tonight and I'll probably be back down to three tomorrow. So I know that it's going to be a rough week. Okay. So what am I focusing on protein? I go right back to like day one, right? If I can control my protein intake, I can control at least something and it's going to be okay. But even if that's not the case, even if things are like a decent, like sleep schedule, everything's working pretty good. Or maybe like you just started, you just want to focus on that protein and you don't want to be unrealistic. Like what, like I was saying with Justin, you want to have an achievable number, right? An achievable number. So like for him, it was total calories. Okay. So like 2,500, like that was based on math and the metrics and the the scale that we're using. It should be about 2,500 calories. That was too much, right? That's going to be too much for him. It's not going to be, it's not going to be realistic for him to hit. So let's get protein in, focus on that. And then let's choose an achievable, sustainable goal for total calories where it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Right. And we're stacking wins and we're creating like the circuits and the wiring, like neurologically to stack wins. And once you stack wins, then you want more wins. And then that's how you get reinforced positively with that, which also is really important too. So as much as maybe it's things aren't perfect from a, a a number standpoint, you also want to set it, be realistic about things and be able to win. You don't want to just be losing all the time. When you lose all the time, that's very negative and It just, it doesn't create sustainability. And that again is what we're talking about. Like sustainability, long-term big picture stuff. Don't make big changes, bigger changes than are sustainable over a month or a longer timeframe. Again, that's what I mentioned earlier that if, if you're getting into a massive deficit straight out of the gate, like new, it's like new year's day, like, all right, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat any sweets for the year. Like, all right, how long did that last? week and a half, right? So that don't make something so un, unachievable that it, you're you're not going to do it, okay? So that that's a really important factor. All right, so training, when we're getting into training on this, I had a question about can I do more work than what's on the plan? And the answer for that is maybe. <laughs> on this plan, on the Heroic 28 plan, there's three days of lifting, And there's three days of aerobic work. And we'll get into more what aerobic work and energy system work means here shortly. But it's three days a week of lifting, right? So can you do more lifting? Yeah, you could probably do more lifting as long as you're monitoring intensity. So if your intensity is 10 out of 10 for those three days, that's cool. But we don't want to make six days where we're 10 out of 10, especially coming into a program. Like we don't want to just go zero to a hundred. Again, it's the same thing. Like you don't want to make bigger changes than are sustainable over a month or longer time frame. This is something I used to tell people at the CrossFit gym when I used to own that. I was like, when you come in for your week free trial, I really don't want you crushing a 10 out of 10 workout three days in a row so that on day four, you're so sore, you can't move. And then you're gone for days five, six, and seven. And then you're not coming back for another week. And then you missed half your free week. And then you don't convert into a member. That's a problem, right? If we're playing this, like 
this yo-yo game up and down where it's like I go really hard and then I'm too sore to move. So I'm out for a week and then I'm back for a day. And then that's how these weekend warrior injuries are created. So can you do more than three days a week lifting? Yes, you can. As long as you're not being a maniac about it and it's realistic for what you have the capacity to do mentally and physically, right? Can't, you can't go past that. And because then it's just big, again, big picture standpoint, like we have to have a month or longer of volume, not just like a week or a day, like the big picture outweighs the small picture. All right. And on top of the three days a week of lifting, we have three days a week of energy system and aerobic work. And this shit is important. All right. So this is like CrossFit ish 101. They go over this a ton. It's not really CrossFit, but they covered a ton in the, in the level one courses. So understanding your aerobic system and like the different energy systems that are built into your body. And there are more than this. There's, there, the more research they do, the more there's a, a lactate system that's in the middle here too. But these are the three big ones we're going to stick with and just know that there, are, <laughs> this is like the dummy version of this information. There's a lot more to it, a lot more to it that I don't understand or don't know. All right. So when you're looking at your aerobic system, your aerobic system is, has got different energy systems in it. The phosphogenic system, is like time frame. So you look at your maximum ratio of energy output. This is your intensity on this line here. And then your time is on this axis here. Really high intensity for the phosphagen creatine system. And this is like your 100 meter sprints, your one rep maxes. Like this, like zero to 10 seconds is about where it tops out. So even if you're running a 200 meter sprint or a 400 meter sprint, like you're going to be past this energy system when you get about hundred to 200 meters into this sprint work. This is like all of your super fast twitch muscles and it's very explosive. All right. The next system is the glycolytic system or here they have it, the anaerobic glycolysis system. Glycolytic is it. And that literally means like with carbohydrates as your primary fuel source. So within this frame, you're looking at zero-ish to, this has a minute, but I would say it's probably a two and a half to, depending on the person, you could even stretch it out to three and a half minutes. And everybody's going to be slightly different based on where their individual thresholds are. And you can do a ton of different cool testing to find out like where your threshold limits are. And I think that's what this critical point here, these are probably thresholds. I just pulled this off the internet. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but this is roughly where that, that lactate threshold. I don't know if you guys ever hear anybody talk about that kind of stuff. That's probably right where this is right about there, maybe at two minutes and again, depending on the athlete. So that's anywhere like this glycolytic, you're talking like an 800 meter run. If you've ever done CrossFit, Fran is like a clutch glycolytic workout, 21, 59 thrusters and pull-ups. Grace would be another one, 30 reps, clean and jerk as fast as you can do them at 135. So that's going to take you about a minute and a half. So that's all glycolytic stuff. That's the kind of stuff, or like what I had the other day, like an 800 meter foot chase across a bunch of roads and like through a backyard. And then you tackle a guy like that's glycolytic. That's like glycolytic as fuck. Like the stuff where after you're done, you have a pounding headache and it's kind of like, <laughs> you get that thing, right? That's all glycolytic. If you ever hit that point, that's like anaerobic, like glycolysis is what this has. And that's exactly what it is. So once you get beyond that, then you have your aerobic glycolysis system or your oxidative is what we always talk about with CrossFit. So that's anything beyond about two minutes to about where infinity, basically. So two minutes to like 40 minutes, 50 minutes, that kind of stuff, your long-term aerobic stuff, right? Why is it important to know this kind of stuff is because as much as I screwed this up, I hope other people don't have to. If you work this direction from your phosphocreatine system to your, glycoly to your glycolytic to your oxidative or aerobic, like if you work this way and you prioritize this and then that, or as CrossFitters screw up, this is the priority is the glycolytic system over anything else you will not build a super robust aerobic system. And that will result in errors. That will result in adaptation errors and injuries, okay? This is the stuff that everybody has fun with. This is jujitsu. This is sparring. This is 
typically like a ton of different CrossFit events, CrossFit workouts. That's the stuff that's going to leave you sprawled out, sweating, being like, oh man, that was a good workout, right? <laughs> this is not where you need to spend the bulk of your time. This is where you need to spend the bulk of your time, right? In your aerobic system and really ramping up your aerobic system. Your aerobic base will make this stuff better, but this stuff will not make this better. Okay, so that's why, or part of the reason why, you need to prioritize your aerobic system. And also, your aerobic base, this is very important, your aerobic base dictates your ability to accumulate total volume, okay? I'm going to say that one again, because we're going to have to break it apart here for a second. Your aerobic base dictates your ability to accumulate total volume, all right? So the bigger your aerobic base is, the higher of a ceiling you have for doing total work. And that includes lifting, that includes jujitsu, that includes whatever, golfing, that, whatever you do, right? That's your total volume. Your ceiling for total volume is higher if your aerobic base is more broad, is stronger. And that's the same reason that West Side Barbell athletes, the strongest platform athletes, power lifters on the globe, the reason that they do so much GP or general physical preparedness is because they understand this, right? That they need a very big base of general physical preparedness in order to sustain the total volume that they need to do all their accessory work. Because if they did not focus on that, then they would not be able to do all the work and they would not be the strongest athletes in the world. So that is hypercritical. So how does that apply to the program? the heroic 28 like we have three days a week of energy work and that includes short intervals which is basically glycolytic work or phosphogenic work long intervals which is like threshold work here into your aerobic system and then tempo work which is all aerobic system oxidative stuff we're skewing harder towards this than we are towards this as far as sprint work goes and with the lifting it's not really like rocket science here. The priorities are to build muscular size and strength for durability as well as looking jacked and awesome and swole. That's very important. <laughs> but but it's the lifting is, that's what we're doing. We're trying to build strength, but we're also building size and durability on this program. And uh, and that is is super critical too. We have to have the physical structure to support the work that we're doing. So there's more to lifting than just one rep maxes and stuff like that. That's very important, but it's only one aspect of it. And there, there's only three days a week of lifting, which it's good volume, but it's not like super high volume. And if you want an all lifting program, like we definitely have those, the Heroic 28 might not be the one for it. So anyway, all right. And I already mentioned this building as well as building a strong aerobic, strong, robust aerobic system with the ability to aid in performance, health, and recovery. That's another thing that's worth talking about real quick. This an, this aerobic energy system, this oxidative energy system will support cardiovascular health in ways that your anaerobic system does not, okay? And especially working in a profession where like an abundance of irregular, unpredictable stress is always around the corner, like your aerobic system has to be strong because if it's not, by the time you retire, like you're going to be fucked and your heart's not going to be in good shape. And the stats are five years after retirement, cops are dead. So like into your retirement, into your later years, like this has to be something that's focused on. And to be honest, like I'm in year 16 almost and I can feasibly retire in four years. That's crazy to me that I'm already at this point. But this is something that's more in in my like immediate focus because of that. That's really important for everybody to think about throughout our careers is this has to be a focus over or at least a higher volume than the super sexy anaerobic glycolytic stuff. All right. And then the last part I'm going to mention here is the last component of this stuff is nutrition is one component. Training is one component. And then all the lifestyle stuff, like that is maybe the most important thing that, that we don't focus on, but like sleep hygiene, especially being first responders in shift work, like stress again, 
being all over the place, like as far as schedules go, you have to know what sleep hygiene is and how to downregulate so that you can get good rest. And that, because it, it, the rest that we get might not be at times when our body should be sleeping. Like I mentioned earlier, like I've gone three hours of sleep from last night. I'm going to have at least two more days this week where I know that's going to be the case because I have a detail at night and then I got to get up the next morning for shift. So I'm going to be running on some bullshit sleep. So what does that tell me? That tells me that I need to, number one, I'm off tonight. So I need to front load sleep. So as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to work on my sleep hygiene, start down regulating, turning all the lights off, calming down, and then getting ready to go to sleep, right? Because if I don't do this stuff, then I'm going to get some shit sleep on the only night that I know I have available to sleep. Okay. Consistent bedtime. So as much as you can do it, you got to be consistent with getting your ass into bed at the same time. And if that's like such a super foreign concept that where it's, no, I can't do that, or I don't do that, or I'm all over the place, kids, this work that like, okay, I get that. We're probably making some excuses with it, but I do understand that is a lifestyle that we have. Like you got to do the best you can to say, do you have a drop dead time of 11 o'clock? I'm in bed. And even if you are not asleep because you're, you didn't do a good job with down regulating, you're still learning how to do it. You're still getting into bed at the same time and creating habits, right? Now for, for me, the pager might go off in five minutes. I might have to get my ass up and leave again, but at least I'm getting in bed at that same time. Okay. And then another thing that, that really helps with a ton of stuff, and I'm not going to go into all the science because I didn't do a ton of research tonight on it. But you're feeding and fasting windows. And what I want to focus on with that is consistency, right? Talk about sleep hygiene equals like doing the same thing, routine, routine, consistent bedtime, routine, feeding and fasting windows, right? You got to have a 12 hour block. And the more I look at things and the more I play around with this, like a 12 hour fasted window and a 12 hour feeding window really do some good stuff. As far as giving your gut time to heal, giving your body time with, without food to kind of readjust to insulin sensitivities, stuff like that, and creating consistency as to what your meals are and when they are, right? So I typically go and I'll eat later because I train later and, and I like to get most of my carbs after my training. I'll have my bedtime. This is just speaking for me personally, but I'll have my bedtime about between 10 and 10 30. I'm working hard to get that consistent, but it's a pain in my ass. But so I got about a half hour wiggle room that I'm trying to tighten up. Now I'll stop eating at right about that time. I'll eat right, right up till bedtime. And then I know I won't eat again until 11 AM the next day. So that gives me a good 12 hour fasted window. And then I'll start eating all my food in that, in that like 10 hours or 11 hours that, uh, that I have with the rest of the day. That means I've got another hour to eat <laughs> and then get to bed. So that creates some stuff, some issues. You're always looking at pros and cons of things, right? So like for me, the pros are that I get my carbs and everything in post-workout and then and then I'll go to bed, right? And then I won't eat again until about between 10 and noon, honestly, the next day. But that does sometimes create issues because I eat so close to bedtime. So there's that as a downside. Sometimes it can disrupt your sleep if you have too high fats close to bed. And if you're really looking at leaning out, then you would maybe want to push that window up a little bit. So I'd cut it off at 8.30, 9 o'clock, and then your fasted window would end at 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. You could even push it up to 10 if you wanted to, if you wanted to extend the fast a little bit. So there's that. And again, like I'm looking at this feeding fasting window from like a consistency application to routine right? That's the biggest thing with this that I'm talking about right now. Now there is a ton of other research. God, what's the guy's name? Dr. Shin Panda, I believe did a great podcast with Andrew Huberman. I don't know, maybe a year ago, maybe less than that, but uh, he is an expert on shift work and nutrition for shift work. And this is what he was talking about was a, a 12 hour, a 12 hour, 12 and 12 feeding and fasting window for shift workers. And he specifically talked about firefighters, which was disheartening for me, but nonetheless, that was the research. And uh, yeah, so I, I can't remember all the details of that, but basically what they found was that it was very impactful 
for shift work and having a consistent restricted feeding window. And that was affecting health markers and affecting body weight and doing all kinds of good stuff. That might be something that, that you need to play around with a little bit. You need to kind of like ease into maybe one day a week, maybe three days a week before you just go a whole hog into it. But, but definitely you're going to want to play around with that is, and definitely as far as being a shift worker, cop, firefighter, military, whatever, if you're dealing with an inordinate amount of stress and an unpredictable schedule, like you're going to want to put this, these kind of things in place. The only thing I would say, or one of the only things like, when should I not do this? All right. There's a couple of, th- of things that come to mind. Number one, if you are competing in a sport of any kind and trying to work for performance, then this is more of a health marker thing rather than a performance marker thing. So your performance could suffer based on this 12 hour feeding and fasting window. So if you start getting into stuff like jujitsu tournaments or powerlifting or CrossFit, and you really are wanting to ramp performance up, that might be something that needs to be reassessed. So you're working with different goals then, right? You're working on a performance goal. You need to have performance, uh, nutrition and lifestyle, right? So make sure, making sure things match up. And with that, like, you just have to remember the downside is like you do things for performance that aren't necessarily healthy, right? So like I played a lot of years of football and I'm still reaping the benefits of that because that's super not healthy, right? Why is my neck hurt? Oh, I ran my face into another dude for 20 years straight, right? Yeah. Okay. That was maybe not the best choice, but whatever, regardless, you have to understand what you're doing and, and stack things in order to make it work. Okay. The other thing, especially thinking on the job, like when should you disregard your feeding fasting window? And I would say if I'm in a fasted window and all of a sudden I have to go to a hostage barricade or something and I haven't eaten in 12 hours, I'm probably going to smash some food real quick. So I have some calories in my system because I don't know when the next time I'm going to get to eat is going to be. And I'm just going to say, fuck it. I guess I'm done with my fasting for today. And I'm going to eat a bunch of food so that I can go and be alert and be on point for what I need to. Again, that is the same thing. We're now shifting away from like a health stand standpoint. And it's okay. I need to be able to transition into a performance standpoint because I might have to go and take care of some business from a tactical standpoint. There, there's just that stuff. You have to be flexible at the same time, if that makes sense. So there you go. Those are all the points that I want to make for tonight. Andrew, did you have any questions on any of that stuff? I know I, you jumped in here at the halfway point, but do you have any questions on that or do you have any questions on anything else? Not really. I tried to catch as much as I, as much as I could, which most of it was answered at the very end, especially when it came to the fasting portion. Cause I've always done like a base intermittent fasting from like 12 to eight. Cause it was the easiest thing to do with my schedule being all over the place. And I, te- I texted you the other night because I just had, I thought I needed to stop eating at eight. So I don't know if maybe I just misread some of the stuff from the app or somewhere from the program and maybe you just thought it was from 12 to eight. I wasn't sure, but it makes it, I guess the way you explained it made it a little bit easier to understand that if I'm going to bed at 10 p.m. for whatever reason, maybe hold off eating the next day until 11 trying to keep the 12 hour fasted and then you answer the thing I, I caught the tail end of the i texted you about working out three days a week i caught the tail end of that where you said if i can and my body's recovered well then that's fine but not to absolutely murder myself to where i'm struggling for the next several days yeah just making sure that you're looking at overall volume like total volume don't yeah. you don't want to destroy yourself as long as you're recovering well then it's all good especially if you've got a base already of lifting then it's probably fine yeah okay. if you feel like you're breaking down or like progress is slowing yeah maybe we need to just chill that a little bit but a lot of things too or a lot of times too i have to tell people like don't skip this work it seems really boring sometimes cuz 20 minutes on the bike or whatever all nasal breathing like this sucks it's boring it's stupid it, it might be boring you might not like it but it's one of those things where it's, we got to get the volume in we got to get the volume in for the aerobic work and if we don't we'll be missing a key component i like lifting a lot more than doing that too and some days i just got to be like 
this is just what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I just gotta, I just gotta get it done. Is there, if there's ever a day, cause most of my stuff is in the morning. I'm still trying to figure out how to lay out my diet as much, like pretty much the way I'm eating is every three hours, unless I am just starving for whatever reason. Like today I've barely ate anything today. When I got home, I think I just ate six ounces of ground beef and then a few ounces of chicken that I was left over from earlier because I came home to eat. And as soon as I literally, as soon as I sat down, my sheriff went out without telling me to a call that he got for someone sending his family member a video of him and his AK-47 saying he's going to kill himself and he wasn't going to be the only one going. And so I was like, so I'm not eating now. So went over that and then it was just bombarded and I haven't had any time to eat. I'm trying to get that down, I guess, just working on the diet, but the diet isn't hard. I'm just trying to find the time to, I'm trying to cram a bunch of food in because I work five days a week. So with my schedule being mid, like a mid shift, I have to cram it because I don't have a lot of downtime, but when days that I work later, it's a little bit easier to eat the smaller meals five times a day, four or five times a day. So it really doesn't matter is I would say like, as long as you're getting three hours between meals, then mm -hmm. you're still hitting that like fasted or pseudo fasted state between those things for like protein synthesis. So there's a bunch of sciences. So you want to be in like an extended, like uh, at least three hours of a fasted state so that protein synthesis can kick back on. If you go longer than that, it's not a big deal. As long as you're getting your protein in and your total calories are, it's looking pretty good or pretty close. Like protein is number one. If we can get that in, like it's a win. If we can get total calories in, that's a double win. And then we're probably doing okay. So those are the two metrics that really matter. Now, if we can, if we can get things to, to track carbs, fats, proteins, so we know where all the stuff is and we have all those levers we can pull, that's awesome. Then we're killing it. But as you, you don't have to get there right away. And if you have days like today where it's, oh man, it's just a disaster. I went from run to run. I thought I was done. And then I got called back out. Dude, that's, that's the name of the game. So we have our primary uh, our primary plan, which is like, all right, I'm going to get every three hours. I have a meal. I've got all my stuff mapped out. I know I'm going to get 200 grams of protein. Yeah. Boom, boom. Everything's good until it's not right. And then we have a contingency plan where it's okay. Shit. Like now I got punched in the face. I got all this stuff going on. I'm going to take these, this food, and I'm just going to hold it until the end of the day. And then I'm just going to smash some food at the end of the day. And I'm going to try to get my protein in. And as long as I get my protein number in, it's a win for that day. And it, that's just the nature of the chaos of, of our lives as cops. Now, you have to be able to execute on your contingency plan to make sure that you're hitting your base level stuff. Protein is your base level stuff. So you really, there, there are very rare instances where you are just, well, I just, uh, I couldn't get my protein in today. You couldn't get any protein in there's You didn't eat any food. Like that to me would say, I didn't get to eat any food and I'm totally fasted for 24 hours. If that's mm -hmm. the case, then I say, all right, you're probably right. But if you ate some food today, like you really don't have a reason not to be close on protein. Like you should have some way to get protein in. You have to have some plan. Even if things get all fucked up, you have to have some plan to get close to your protein goal. I know for me, it's like 175. If I can get 175 grams of protein in on a bad day, it's going to be okay. My protein or my total calories might be off low or maybe even high. If I had really high fat foods, like maybe my calories are really high, but I'm still good on protein. Okay. It'll work out in the long run, but I have to have that contingency plan in place. And I have to be able to execute on either my primary plan. If things go perfect or my contingency plan, if they go to shit. So if today is a contingency day, like you just got to figure out like, how could I have hit 200 grams of protein or whatever it is, right? That's the thing. If you can do that, like these days where things fall apart, like you'll be able to navigate them and still make plenty of progress. Yeah. The last few nights I've just been absolutely housing protein shakes, like just going to grab a couple of fair life protein shakes and just down on them. Cause it's <laughs> the quickest thing I can get because if I don't have anywhere to like when I leave the house to store my food that it's not getting spoiled or anything sitting in my cruiser, I don't want to spend money on fast food all the time because our fast food here is not very great. And I don't have any protein. I don't have any at the house, like powdered protein. 
Okay, so don't supplement your way into protein. Fair life's okay. There's it's not there's, too much of it. There, it depends, man. You're looking at milk. All right, so milk and dairy, like that's a whole nother conversation, but it is inflammatory, right? And for some people, for actually a lot of people, milk can be highly inflammatory, meaning that you'll hit your protein number, but your gut's going to be really inflamed. Now, fair life is like lactose free, I think. So it'll probably do less, but it's, it's a proliferate, which mm -hmm. means that like, why do animals drink milk to grow? It's proliferate, it's anabolic, and it's inflammatory. Those things can be good, but they can also be really negative if you're trying to like lean down and, and lose weight yeah. and that kind of stuff. So it, you don't want to try to get your protein in at, at the, the detriment of the big picture. Yeah. So if that's the case where you're like, all right, I'm smashing protein shakes and fair life and like all these, this liquid protein, I understand what you're doing, but just take a step back and say like, all right, how can I get one or two of these and not three or four and eating protein, eating food is going to be really important. So if that's the case and like something that I talk to a lot of guys about is doing smoothies, right? So if you do a smoothie with some fair life and maybe you can put other like collagen protein, stuff like that, then that can be a way to load up a bunch of calories in like a liquid form. And if you put some greens in there, stuff like that, it's not super tasty, to be honest, when you do put greens and make these super big smoothies, but yeah. it'll get the job done. And it's, it's not that bad. You get used to it. It's not like a milkshake, but it, it's, yeah. it's basically doing the same thing that you're doing right now. It's just, you're putting a little bit more purpose behind it. But yeah, man, that for week one, you'll get there. Like you're making, you're putting the stuff together the right way. Now we just have to like tweak it and nuance it and you'll be right on track. So how much protein are you getting? Daily? I've been trying to make sure I hit at least 200 grams a day. Okay. I try. Uh, it, if you see like from what I'd sent you, I'm, I think I'm the lowest day I had was two days ago, maybe. And I was at like 160 or 170. But I think where I'm struggling is because it's not adding enough of the protein that I eat. So usually when I do chicken or bison or beef or whatever it is, I'm only doing six ounces of it. I'll do six ounces of whatever beef or whatever meat. And then I'll do the green, like the broccoli, because that's the only greens I really like. And then I'll do my cup of rice. And that'll fill me up for God knows however long. And so I haven't added any more protein because I tried one day I tried to eat eight ounces, like seven ounces or eight ounces of chicken. I didn't finish it. I didn't come close to finishing it. So that's why I've been down in like the fair life protein shakes is because I'm looking at everything else and I'm getting, I'd say at least a little over a hundred grams of protein from my meals alone. Like I ran out of eggs. Like I now I'm out of my groceries right now. So I'm out on a rice. My wife's at the grocery store right now getting a bunch of stuff. But I think that was an issue the other day. Just I wasn't able to add in the eggs for breakfast and egg whites just because I'm out. I'm trying to get most of everything through food, but I think I'm just trying to, I may not have to just add more, I guess more ounces of protein or meat or whatever it is instead of just five or six ounces. Yeah. So the, here's the way you can do it. Cause it's just, it's basic math, right? You either make, you're right on track. Like you either make those meals bigger with protein. You just add more of the protein or mm -hmm. you add another meal somewhere. And then it's, it all evens out. Um, oh, okay. You know what I mean? So either way you got to add more food, right? So you, <laughs> yeah. you can either yeah. add more food to your current meal structure and make those meals bigger, or you can just add another meal. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's just whatever you want it to do. And I don't think you were on the call yet, but, but I was talking about the pro tip for nutrition for the night is so tonight when your wife gets home, after you help her put the groceries away and stuff like that, like you sit down and you map out your food for tomorrow, then you, put, you plug that all in. So you know that you've got that 200 grams of protein, you know what it's going to take to hit that you have yeah. that food ready to go. And then tomorrow when you get up, you just take it and you go and it's already plugged in. So you've already done the math. You've already done all the work. And now you, all you have to do is execute on that plan. And if you do that every night before the next day, then it's, it's so easy to execute the plan versus if you wake up and then you're trying to figure it out on the fly, like at the end of the night, you'll be like, shit, I still got 50 grams of protein. Where am I going to get this? Yeah. That way you're not behind the curve.
but it, and then, and again, we work in a profession where we're good at being told what to do and we're following directions and that kind of stuff. So if you give yourself a plan, then you'll follow the plan. But if you don't, it'll just be like, we're fuck, I'm short or I'm over. Okay. But outside of that, I don't, I think I'm just having to relearn a lot of what I thought I knew, or I guess why I say I, I've known it, but I've been doing a different kind of training for the last my entire life. Really, it's always been powerlifting or something related to football. So I'm going to relearn a bunch of stuff and get back into all that. I don't have any kind of supplements that I take. So I'm trying to figure out, I was going to go buy some protein, but I don't, some protein and maybe some, I don't know what else I would buy, but I wasn't sure what to get, what would be the best. No, I don't want to buy a shit protein with a bunch of just shit ingredients. Yeah, but protein is pretty much all the same. So I was just thinking today, I got to do, I got to do some content on supplements because I never even talk about them, but you're looking for a cold filtered whey protein. And I like isolates over mm-hmm. concentrates. Most of them are blends of isolates and concentrates. It's got like half and half or whatever, or a proprietary blend of both. But I like isolates. They're a little bit easier to digest than concentrates, but e- either one's going to get the job done and they're all basically the same. So as long as it's a cold filtered whey isolate, it really is all like whatever. Okay. But if you're doing those fair lifes, you can do a fair life in place of that protein is it's got, I'm not sure what the fat content is in the fair life offhand, but I think it's pretty comparable. The only thing is it might have a higher fat than higher fats okay. than obviously protein supplements have no fat yeah. protein. Yeah. And then as far as other supplements, like the only other supplements that I ever recommend for people, generally speaking, would be a good quality fish oil and creatine so. i was taking creatine for a while but i was i don't know what the issue was i was just staying bloated and felt like i was just staying bloated all the time yeah so you can hold water and that's what it's designed to volumize your cells and stuff like that so you will retain a little bit of weight from water on creatine but as long as it's a good source like a crea pure source and stuff like that you shouldn't get like the 1990s like <laughs> how old are you 26 okay so this is before your time then like when i was like 15 it was like when in the 90s when creatine came out and people were like oh god creatine and everybody was taking it It was like it makes you huge but everyone thought it was going to burn your kidneys out and people wouldn't yeah. let their kids take yeah. it so yeah. everybody's freaking out about it turns out like none of that was true but back in the day creatine the shitty creatine you know, it was the powdery stuff you'd open the bag and it was like poof <laughs> that stuff would blow you up big time. But now it's not as much as long as you're drinking enough water. Usually that's the issue. Yeah. I don't think I have any other off the top of my head anyways that I can think of any more questions for this one. Sorry, I was late. On no, that one. all good, man. All good. Cool. I will get this edited up and posted and then you can catch up on the back end stuff when I do that. And uh, Carmen, you got anything else for the good of the order? No, just I wanted to reiterate, I always cook my meat and so it's ready for the week. So if I don't meet my calories, I know I'm going to hit my protein because I'll have fish, chicken or beef already cooked and I can just grab that and go. So that's my snack to go or my meal to go. If I know I'm going to be busy, I'll put it. So I always know. I concur. And then you can always put it in a blender and do a meat shake. (laughs) Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what was that guy? There was a, the strong man, dude. How, what the hell was his name? Something Poundstone, I think. He's there, Poundstone. Yes. They, he's from Michigan. And yeah. uh, he was a Michigan State trooper, but he was this professional strong man. He would do that. He would blend chicken breasts and just drink this sludge. Wow. Oh, oh, God. I'm going gonna, gonna to puke. <laughs> so you yeah. can do that. You can do that if you would like to. I don't know. But all right, if you guys have any questions this week and uh, you know where to find me, okay? All right. Okay. All right. All right, good work and I'll talk to you guys later. All right, see you guys. Later.